Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Barrett. I'm a professor in SIPA, School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia, and also in the Earth Institute. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar series, COVID-19 Policymaking in the Throes of a Global Crisis, which I'm co-hosting with Jeff Sachs and Yanis Ben Amor. Uh, Yanis is with us. Jeff, we expect, will join us. Our speaker today is Dr. Joseph Allen, who's an assistant professor in the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and is an expert on uh, buildings and the effect that buildings have on us. Um, he's the author, co-author of the book, Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Drive Performance and Productivity or I might add maybe misery and illness. I guess it, it could go either way. Um, and uh, as Jeff uh, said at last week's seminar, uh, the work that Dr. Allen does is truly fascinating. And Jeff said he didn't even know that there was such a field as this. And, and now um, having uh, gotten to know um, uh, Professor Allen, he's been, um, really stimulated to think about buildings. So, and as we all, uh, many of us at least, work in buildings and we're all very keen to um, know more about buildings and the foundations of your work, uh, Professor Allen. So over to you, you'll speak for a while and then we'll go into a question and answer period. So welcome and, uh, and thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, that's great. So thanks for that introduction, Scott. Thanks to Giannis, you and also Jeff for inviting me uh, to talk about this. Um, I'll try and give, stimulate the conversation a bit, then really looking forward to just a discussion, question and answer. Uh, there's a million topics we could talk about, as we all know, uh, and I'm happy to just weigh in on uh, at least what I'm seeing from my vantage point. I, um, for background, so I, I direct the Healthy Buildings Program at the Harvard uh, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm a professor there, a certified industrial hygienist, uh, work in occupational uh, health and safety for a long time now. And maybe as relevant for outside of the academic world is that I've done consulting for over a decade, really on for, doing forensic investigations of sick buildings. So have seen um, the worst of the worst in terms of radiological hazards, chemical, biological, physical hazards in offices, schools, uh, you name it, uh, manufacturing facilities, uh, where even some you know people had died, even in places where kids had died. And the question is always, well, is it safe to go back and what controls need to be in place before it is okay? So in many ways, the pandemic is unfamiliar to all of us, but in, in at least some in ways, it's familiar in the sense that we know how to assess hazards and put in controls in buildings. So that's where uh, how I'm approaching this. been working with um, uh, Jeff and Giannis on the Lancet COVID-19 Commission and also advising uh, universities, K through 12 schools. I'm a special advisor to the Massachusetts Supreme Court on reopening jury trials, uh, community child care centers, uh, media, the arts. So everyone is facing the same kind of questions. Really, how do you get your buildings uh, safe for reopening? But let's take a step back quick and recognize that we always knew buildings were going to play a role in a pandemic. This is an editorial I wrote with a colleague, uh, the Journal of Exposure Science Environmental Epi back in early December. Uh, talking about buildings and pandemics, right? We didn't know it would be this year, but certainly all of us, all of you uh, have known that a pandemic was going to happen. We narrowly escaped other coronavirus pandemics, MERS and SARS uh, and influenza viruses. So it wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. And when the when came, which is now, uh, we knew buildings would play a key role. Been trying to not only do research, but maybe more importantly, uh, is really translate the existing research into strategies the public can take. So this is one of the earlier op-eds I wrote in the New York Times in March, uh, talking about healthy building strategies and what can be done in terms of uh, your building's um, systems to help protect against transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And as Scott said, you know, we know and have known forever that a building can either exacerbate the problem or protect us. And unfortunately, we have been in the sick building era, and I can talk more about that for the past several decades, where we haven't made decisions all the time that are based around human health. We've, we've, as crazy as this sounds, we've stopped building buildings for people. 
Uh, and so we've been on, um, you know, I think it's every two weeks or so have a new op-ed, including one that came out yesterday. This is not the one from yesterday, but talking about the role of buildings, in particular airborne transmission. So this is another one back in May talking about airborne transmission and super spreading events. This is important because it talks about the strategies that the building can, we can do with our buildings to protect us. But it's premised on the notion that airborne transmission is happening. And this has been in the news a lot over the past couple of days. But let me talk through some of the evidence. Uh, but I'll first say this, the very first piece I wrote on this coronavirus was in, I wrote it in the end of January, it published in Financial Times in early February and included, um, included information and citations that we knew enough even then that airborne transmission was likely happening. Since that time, every piece of scientific evidence uh, has further supported that. And I'll just, I'm not gonna walk through all of these, but I do wanna talk about them. And if we'll start on the left is the list of the evidence. Uh, but maybe I'll just orient you to what's on the screen. I'm gonna get to this case study of the cruise ship. This is a paper my team and I wrote uh, out in preprint as of a month ago. But let's start with the basics here in terms of how do we know airborne transmission is happening? We should start with basic aerosol physics. Anytime we uh, talk, breathe, sing, cough, sneeze, we emit a continuum of airborne particles of different sizes, right? The very small up to 100 microns. The 100 micron particles will settle out quickly. In fact, within that two meter or six foot buffer. The particles we're most interested in, or let's, let's take one step back. After you emit these, many of the larger particles will evaporate very quickly on the order of seconds and they become droplet nuclei or smaller airborne particles. These airborne particles in the range of one to 10 microns or even smaller can stay aloft for 30 minutes or hours, depending on their size. The smaller ones will stay aloft indefinitely and they travel well beyond six feet. The problem has been, you know, well, where did this six foot buffer come from is that it's been a misunderstanding that's deep in the medical textbook going back decades that a five micron particle will settle out of the air within six feet. That is inconsistent with physics. Uh, we know this. So these particles will, will travel beyond six feet and will stay aloft. In fact, they'll stay aloft until one of three things happens. They're diluted out of the air through ventilation. They're cleaned out of the air through filtration or they deposit in the lungs. And you actually have to account for all of those in any airborne model you do. And of course, we're trying to protect that last one from happening. So if we just look at the basic aerosol physics, that's enough to tell us this is happening. Then uh, we've had information from actual field sampling. We've seen RNA detected in hospitals in, the, in places that can only be reached by the air, like ductwork. Uh, a recent study in August, we detected, we being the broader scientific community, not, not me or my team, uh, have detected viable virus at 16 feet beyond a patient in a hospital, showing that this in fact can happen. What we knew hap could happen is actually happening. Then we have the case studies, the restaurant in Guangzhou, China, where, uh, or, and the hospital, uh, hospital outbreak in South Africa, the, the infamous choir practice outbreak in Washington, this cruise ship outbreak. And on many of these, you see a common set of factors. In fact, it goes to schools, camps, uh, the recent bus case. You have places where people are indoors, no masking, uh, and low to no ventilation rates. In fact, look at the choir practice. I had 50 plus people infected out of 60. There's no way fomite transmission or contaminated services explains that. Some contribution from close contact and droplet, okay. The thing that tipped me off first in the hospital study was that, I mean, the uh, choir practice outbreak was that the choir practice happened in the evening. And we know what happens in buildings in the evening. The ventilation system shuts off or turns way down. So it was the first tip to me when I first read that case, I said, you know what? This sounds a lot like airborne transmission. Sure enough, Shelley Boulder out at Colorado University, uh, and Shelley Miller at Colorado University Boulder, uh, and others actually did the actual analytics and, and quantified this and, and airborne transmission is happening. They showed it. My own team's work here led by postdoc Parham Azimi. Uh, we did, looked at the Diamond Princess cruise ship. And if you look at that figure on the left, the middle bar chart, uh, middle uh, 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 inner uh, 
uh, look at the range of uh, estimated contribution from the different modes of transmission. And we see that our best estimate for uh, the long range aerosols, this is airborne transmission beyond six feet, is over 40% of transmission. So all that to say is that we're quite confident airborne transmission is happening. That means the building can intervene. We've been yelling from the rooftops about this since February. In early July, 239 of us signed a letter to the WHO telling them to recognize or encouraging them to recognize the science on airborne transmission. It's real. Well, we started to get some wins recently. So back in uh, August, Dr. Fauci came to the Harvard School of Public Health via Zoom, and I got to interview him. And I asked him directly about this airborne transmission question. And he said, this is an area we're looking at with my task force right now. So we started to see this turning around. And sure enough, Dr. Fauci comes back to Harvard Medical School two weeks ago doing the grand rounds, and this is his slide. Transmission via particles that remain in the air over time and distance. He talks about this. He also says, uh, we, he had, acknowledges, wow, we've misunderstood this five micron, six foot thing for a long time. And he says, aerosols is happening more than we thought. So we had momentum here. This is two weeks ago. Uh, the Lancet Commission, COVID-19 Commission, that I'm, it's my distinct honor to be a, a part and privilege to be a part of. I'm grateful to Jeff and Giannis uh, having invited me to participate where I chair the task force on safe work, safe schools, and safe travel. And in that statement we just released last week, we talk about the importance of mitigating airborne spread, uh, in particular around super spreader events. So lots of momentum in the system here. And what do you know, the US CDC finally acknowledges airborne spread is happening as of last Friday. And then if you've been paying attention to the news, that was short lived because the CDC abruptly removed that language from their website and decided not to follow the science. No one quite knows the reason, we've heard a couple different reasons by now. Uh, supposedly a, a draft was supposed to be, re, uh, the draft was supposed to be reposted as of two days ago. That still has not happened. Um, but it's kind of consistent with what we, or unfortunately it's been consistent with what we've seen for these uh, communication errors by the CDC, including one only two weeks ago, saying we should not be testing asymptomatic people. The scientific community uh, rightfully uh, flagged that and, uh, and uh, uh, and raise their voices and CDC uh, corrected that. So we'll see what happens now. But I wrote an op-ed about this yesterday with my colleague, Dr. Lindsay Marr, an expert in bioaerosols and uh, transmission saying, yes, look, here's the takeaway. Airborne transmission is happening. That's what the science says. No matter what CDC is doing right now or what kind of, let's just call it uh, shenanigans are happening, um, the, the science is really crystal clear on this point. And that means we just have to add additional controls. Here's where this gets really interesting, and I'm not going to go through all the slides here, uh, the detail here, but this is a graph of the ventilation rates in buildings over 100 years. The y-axis there, vertical axis, is ventilation rate. The red dotted line is the ventilation rate associated with lower disease transmission. Over the past 100 years, we have danced around with the ventilation rates in buildings uh, that have not targeted or not been around the health of people. But we have known better. In fact, we've lost our way. We've stopped designing these ventilation standards like we had in the early 1900s that were targeting health. They were targeting infectious disease transmission. And we've lost our way. We're under, chronically underventilating our indoor spaces. The, the reason why, you know, the ASHRAE is the standard setting body for buildings. The ASHRAE standard is called the standard for acceptable indoor air quality. I don't want to be in a building with acceptable indoor air quality. I don't know about you. We want healthy indoor air quality. So we've lost our way here in designing for these minimum standards. Uh, this is not rocket science. We've known this for a long time. And I like this quote from Florence Nightingale, fresh air from open windows, the only defense a true nurse either asks or needs. Right? We're, we're starting to um, uh, really get back to uh, the basics here, back to connections to nature and back to more indoor air. Let me just quickly move and put this in a bigger context of risk reduction, right? Because of course, ventilation and airborne is not all we're trying to control here. So we've been talking about using uh, or using something that's been used in the worker health and safety field for decades, the hierarchy of controls. For those who know the hierarchy, this is flipped. 
Uh, we flipped it because we were trying to reach a different community. We published this in Harvard Business Review back in April, my co-author John McCumber and I, talking about the hierarchy of controls, the five parts of this, and how it would apply to reopening our offices in the context of COVID-19. First, eliminate the hazard, prioritize work from home. Two, substitute activities. Who are the core minimum people that need to be back and physically present? Three, engineering controls. These are all the healthy building strategies I just mentioned. Four, administrative controls. How do you do de-densification? Managing flows of people through your building. Six foot distancing at a minimum. How do you handle elevators and the rest of it? And fifth is PPE, personal protective equipment. In this context, absolutely universal mask wearing is a must. So after you have these plans in place and you're following the hierarchy, who guarantees your workplace is safe for return? My colleague and I uh, wrote this same piece because we saw lots of companies start to say, okay, I have my plan. Well, now what? Now what do you do? Well, we think there you, some of the things you should be doing are monitoring the performance of your building to, to ensure that you are meeting these targets. And what's on your screen now is actually some monitoring my team did at Harvard Business School as we prepped them for reopening recently. We deployed real-time carbon dioxide monitors in the classrooms. And what, we're, what you see here is the buildup and decay of CO2 in different classrooms at Harvard Business School. And a well-worn, I mean, a, a really tried and true method for estimating air exchange rate is to look at the decay curves. And those are the colored parts of that decay there. And the log of the, of the slope there is the decay, and you, uh, is the air exchange rate. And you can determine, and we see here, that we were doing a really nice job. We had high enough air exchange rates uh, in our buildings. Last thing I'll say before I stop and we just get to the discussion is, you know, this is a real moment. Uh, and I think we all feel this way that uh, it's not just about getting back to uh, January 2020. Uh, it's a time to do things differently. We're seeing the stresses on our environment across our all across our natural world. Uh, COVID is not the only crisis we're facing. And so how do we do this better going forward? And that's a key question. Of course, we want to address the current crisis. And there are things we can do better around our buildings, too. One of the things we talk about in our book and we, in the Harvard Business Review article I just mentioned is the use of health performance indicators. So businesses are really comfortable with talking about KPIs for key performance indicators. We like switching the narrative a bit and saying, let's be explicit that the key, key performance indicator is health. And in terms of the building, you know, below the line is really what's about the building, some leading and lagging indicators. But the premise here is this. It's really quite simple and it's the central premise of the book. Building performance drives human performance. If you get the building right, you're gonna get human perform uh, performance right, health and performance. And then we, we make the case in the book is that this isn't just good for people's health, which should be motivating enough, but we're not blind to the realities of the economics here, but building performance drives human performance, drives business performance. These are ultimately good business decisions. There's no downside to doing these. And the last I'll say is placing buildings in the much larger context of the global mega changes that are influencing us. So certainly we have changing buildings, the changing nature of work. All of many of us who can are, are working from home, but we're facing even a larger crisis here. Uh, we have rapid population growth, uh, more people living in cities than do not, exacerbating the existing strain on our natural environment. And maybe what few people, you know, I think most people certainly in your institute uh, are well aware of this. Buildings play a central role in our health beyond the four walls of the building, largely through our energy uh, choices and, and consumption. Buildings consuming 40% of global energy. So to get this crisis right and the next crisis right uh, and future crises uh, is going to require that we start getting our buildings right because the decisions we make today regarding our buildings Will determine our collective health now and for generations. Um, so with that, let me hope that sparks some uh, ideas for conversations and questions. A lot there, but uh, really looking forward to uh, the Q&A part of this. Thanks. Well, brilliant, Joe. Thank you so much. I see we've been joined by uh, Jeff Sachs. Um, <laughs> Maybe uh, maybe I'll just ask one quick question, uh, quickish, and and then uh, Jeff, you may want to follow. Yanis, you yeah, may want to follow. Great. Right. So, uh, you know, I was always struck by that uh, figure you showed, uh, the historical figure, the figure over time about how um, our buildings haven't really um, been modified to uh, 
to improve our own health and reduce the risk of um, infection, among other things. And I, actually, as I was looking at that, I started to think of examples I know just from my own reading. Uh, so one, for example, pretty striking one, there was a woman working uh, in a building in Birmingham, England, this is in the late 1970s. <clears throat> and it turned out she was infected by smallpox <clears throat> after smallpox had been eradicated worldwide. So there was a, a lab in the same building, but not where she was. She was separate from the lab. She wasn't part of the lab. And that had some stocks of uh, smallpox virus they were using for research. And there was an escape through the ventilation equipment. And she breathed in the smallpox. She became infected. Uh, she survived, but her mother, who cared for her, died of smallpox. And the director of the lab in the same building that she shared in Birmingham, England, committed suicide. It was uh, an event that attracted a lot of interest, a lot of attention. And as a consequence of that, uh, smallpox stocks that had been stored around the world in various labs were collected and uh, consolidated, uh, mainly in uh, the United States, uh, the CDC area, Atlanta, and also um, in, uh, at the time, the Soviet Union. So that was, that's one example. Um, another one that comes to mind was the, one of the previous coronavirus outbreaks, um, SARS, and that, that really became known to us when a doctor from uh, China was, um, uh, had visited Hong Kong and was in the Metropole Hotel and uh, he was a super spreader, or at least there was a super spreader event uh, in which he transmitted just from memory, I think uh, to something like 18 people, but quite a significant number of people. I the mean, R naught for SARS was probably in the two to three, four range, right? So pretty astonishing. Um, these are just two examples. I know there are lots of others. Um, so why is it that when we know that buildings are a problem and that they, uh, cause transmission. Why is it that more action hasn't been taken? Why aren't there stronger standards about this? Um, and are, are there any deviations in the sense that are there some places in the world that do better than others on building standards? Yeah, that's a really great comment, Scott, and uh, and and exa great example. I mean, horrible examples, but perfect examples of the problem. Um, and, you know, I, like I said, I've done these forensic investigations for over 10 years. I've done hundreds of these uh, 11 infant deaths on a military base, thought to be related to housing, uh, cancer cluster in an office. Uh, you know, it's, it's, this is happening all the time. It, it may, people probably aren't even aware of it, but maybe because I'm in that space and I get called, I've been an expert witness, for, it, Legionnaires disease outbreaks. I mean, these are happening every single day in buildings all over the world in every different type of building. Uh, and it speaks to the scale of the problem, to your point, is it, when you start to see these, I think this is where, you know, the, the impetus for writing the book came from. We've been doing it so wrong for so long. And to see so many sick buildings that, by the way, with just a little bit of attention can be turned into the healthier buildings, right? You don't need some fancy new equipment. Just, honestly, just a little bit of attention. And to see that we could fix these every single time. But you just it's like the physician who constantly treats the kid and we don't address the upstream problem of their housing. Same thing, we're treating these sick buildings over and over again without saying, well, hold on, something's broken here. And the thing that's broken is really that we've stopped designing buildings for people, like I said, that these standards are not really set with public health professionals at the table. I'm not saying we should be the only voice, but we're absent. And I've seen this firsthand, even uh, my own university where, you know, I, to our credit, we started inviting public health to the table and the conversation changes because it forces the architect, the designer to say, oh, I, you know, I hadn't really, right down to the materials they're choosing. And they say, well, you know, everybody does it this way. And we say, well, do you know what the science is saying about these chemicals and the products you're putting in our buildings? They interfere with young kids' hormone systems. We can't have that anymore. But everybody, no, we don't care how everybody does it. <laughs> We're changing that. So, you know, but it's taking that kind of, you know, movement to get public health back at the table where, uh, we can start to say, let's set these standards, not for just the occupational exposure limits, you know, uh, that are grossly outdated in most cases, but saying, let's just go to levels that also are about optimum health and thriving, not just disease avoidance. And so we're at that disease avoidance, extreme conditions, you know, buildings will keep you safe 
from you know, extreme hazards, but are they really promoting your health? And they're not really helping in terms of the chronic conditions that we face. So it's gonna take a big flip. And there are enough of those cases you talked about, Scott, that it should have, get, it should have gotten our attention by now. And my hope is that right now, we have the world's attention that, hey, buildings really matter. And it'll lead to not just improvements related to infectious disease, but saying what else matters? Acoustics, lighting, water quality. Let's do it all and do it and do it better right uh, right from the beginning. Great. Uh, maybe I'll uh, come in, uh, Joe. Thanks so much. And uh, fortunately, I was there, but uh, we're having a, a continuing problem of uh, letting me in. <laughs> so, uh, but I was able to hear everything from the start, and so I'm. Uh, really thankful to you. I wanted to come back to the trans, uh, transmission issues just to understand a little bit more uh, specifically. I, I was surprised uh, to see the fomites getting such a large proportion uh, of transmission uh, in uh, the case you studied. Do you think fomite transmission is a big deal? Because when this pandemic started, uh, many of us were wiping down every package, uh, mail, leaving things to the side. And then we stopped, at least uh, we stopped doing that in our household uh, months ago. And uh, is that a mistake? Uh, should we be worried about uh, the fomite transmission? That's question number one. Question number two is about the droplets versus the aerosols. Uh, is there, what do we know about the dose issue and is the dose issue, uh, does that intersect with droplet versus aerosol? Are there necessarily more uh, viral uh, particles uh, in a droplet than an aerosol or aerosols easily have enough to cause an infection or is it just breathing in multiple aerosols uh, in sequence that's likely to be the case there? And then my third uh, specific question is about indoor versus outdoor. Is there any direct evidence uh, about uh, proportions of transmission taking place within buildings versus outdoor, uh, crowded outdoor events like you see in the park with uh, dozens of people? Is that safe or is that, uh, uh, is that itself uh, also um, dangerous or is that the six foot rule or, or whatever? And final question, I've never seen an air exchange graph like you showed us. So is that something that every building uh, should have to uh, go around and look at air exchange uh, as a routine matter? Uh, and is that a low cost, uh, easily available device for schools and for others to be examining that? Yeah, those are really terrific questions. So let me, let me tackle them um, in a row. And I'm gonna start with the third one on, on uh, proportion of, of spread indoors versus outdoors. So, um, one of the biggest studies that examined this found that nearly every single outbreak of three or more people was attributed to time spent indoors. And the one in this one study was two gentlemen that were in cl close proximity and had a multiple hours long conversation. <laughs> so, um, but, the, but yeah, so, you know, outdoors, we get the benefit where we, we, we take out one part of the equation. We take out that ventilation uh, filtration question. You have essentially unlimited dilution. That's important, critically important. You get some more wind movement, even at three feet or six feet, you still have a lot more air movement happening between. So the risks are definitely lower outdoors. Uh, I'm with you, I wrote an article with Mark Lipsitch at Harvard early on saying parks should stay open. We wrote this in late March yeah. as people were closing things. And I understand we, had, we were in a very different information environment then. So I don't blame people for taking extra precautions, but we felt at that time it was okay to open up parks again and, and let people sit on a park bench. Uh, in terms of fomite transmission, yeah. So I agree with you. I think fomite is happening. I think the science is showing that fomite is happening a lot less uh, it's a minor route of transmission. In our study, it looks like there's a lot, but actually there's a lot of variability and it's highly context specific. So on a cruise ship with a buffet where you have an infector uh, and everybody's touching the same kind of, uh, you know, ladle uh, or the same hand railing at the exact same time with everyone funneling through the same spots, yeah, fomite transmission can play a bigger role. Did it account for a major part of that uh, outbreak? Seems unlikely. And in, in our analysis, it's really, like you'd expect from um, thinking about the variables that go into that, essentially Monte Carlo analysis, the fomite transmission is the most uncertain. So the variability is really quite wide. I'd say our best estimate is that it's a lower risk. Absolutely not. People don't need to be wiping down groceries 
when they, you know, I wrote a piece in, in March about this in USA Today saying, uh, or Washington Post about, it's okay to accept a package. It's okay to go grocery shopping. There was some viral video out there of a doctor wiping down every single, you know, ketchup bottle and uh, really scaring the heck out of people. I think it got 20 million views. So we wrote that piece to say, you know what, think about this holistically in terms of risk. So that's, that's on fomite. In terms of dose and droplet, really interesting question. We don't know the dose response curve for this virus. When we do, we'll be able to plug it into our models and really start to quantify risk. But there's something counterintuitive about the droplet versus aerosol conversation. It seems logical that a larger droplet would have more virions, more viral particles, right? But the reality is it, that's not the case. It's more respiratory fluid. So the, the, the smaller particles actually have the larger concentration of virus. And so that's important. They, they stay aloft longer and they travel to the deepest part of our lungs, right? They're down in the alveoli and the gas exchange region. So th this is also why controlling airborne spread is just so absolutely critical. And don't forget the droplets evaporate quickly. The virus is never naked in air. It's always in droplets and these evaporate into the smaller droplet nuclei. Now, there, is there some contribution from ballistic droplets? Yes, there could be, particularly in the healthcare setting, right? We're gonna have people, um, uh, more people are infectious, maybe some uh, aerosol generating procedures happening. But in that dose question, distance still matters, right? So if, I'm, if we're three feet apart talking, Jeff, and I'm infectious, you're gonna get a large dose, right? Six feet, a little less, across the room, less. Can you breathe it in? Yes. Uh, and if the systems are ventilating that air better, maybe even less than you would get. And that dose is, we think is gonna impact one, the likelihood you get it, or two, the severity of disease. Mm -hmm. This is of course why masking is so critical. Last on air exchange rate, you know, those graphs are something that we create um, in our field for a long time. It's a really sim simple way to say, look at the CO2 decay curves, or you can look at steady state carbon dioxide and get an estimate of how well the, how well the space is ventilated. So to put some numbers on this and your question about should everybody be doing this, you can get a cheap, shouldn't say cheap, lower cost real-time monitor for carbon dioxide, $100, $200, that will let you get a sense of how much ventilation you have. And so if you're meeting those minimum standards I mentioned, the indoor concentration will be at 1,000 parts per million. Schools, most of them are 1,500 parts per million, chronically underventilated. Your car will get up to a couple thousand parts per million. Well, you get sleepy when you drive. Mm -hmm. um, if you're meeting these better targets, you'll be down at 800 parts per million, maybe even 600 parts per million, right? And of course, outdoors, 400 and rising too quick, um, just for, for reference and background. The issue with only using CO2, quick, I just want to add one more clarifying point, is that that just covers one of the two removal mechanisms, right? That's dilution through ventilation. If you're using a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter, that's not going to touch the carbon dioxide you might be getting enough air changes per hour of clean air, clean and viral free. Um, so your CO2 might be at a thousand parts per million, but if you're supplementing that with really good ventilation, uh, filtration from a COVID standpoint, you still might be protected even though you're under ventilating your space, which has those other implications but aren't as relevant for infectious disease. So I hope I hit, I think I hit all yeah, four. Great. Perfect. <laughs> I, I have two quick questions. Sorry about the background noise. Um, Joe, to bring it back to the uh, aerosol transmission question. So you're saying that the science is pretty much clear that it is probably also very much aerosol. Uh, you pointed out that the CDC put out the guidelines on Friday, took them down on Monday. Uh, I'm not really sure that the World Health Organization has actually updated their guidelines to say that um, you know, aerosol is, is very much involved. So how does that make your job and everybody else's job more difficult when you come up with designing buildings and coming up with guidelines for travel and reopening schools when the mode of transmission that seems to be the most uh, common is not actually acknowledged. And that leads me to my second question. So you saw that there were two studies that were published this week in emerging infectious diseases about these two flights that took place in March, one from Boston to Hanoi and the other one uh, to Hong Kong. London to Hong Kong. And uh, in both cases, there was a uh, COVID-19 case traveling in business class, and he infected four people in one, and I guess over 100 in the other study. 
Uh, of course, these are trips that took place in March. This is before um, wearing masks was mandatory on flights. So I, I worry that the timing of these studies now is probably going to, if taken out of context and not reported well, could make it think that it's not safe to travel. But what do you think? Have there been any cases reported since masks have been made mandatory in air cabin of, of uh, COVID transmission? Thank you. Yeah, Giannis, two great questions there. And the first is on the communication side and aerosols. Yeah, our job has become uh, complex, right? And we've been, the organizations we talk to, I think we present and lay out the evidence. People say, okay, I buy that. Let's put in these controls. The problem is that message is not reaching everybody. And it's kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat here. And that's why, you know, when a, when a Fauci comes on, someone like Dr. Fauci comes on and says it, that, that moves the needle. When CDC finally said it, my field was thrilled this weekend. Okay, now we have something to point to that will hit everybody. Yep. And so the retraction was just devastating uh, because, you know, still to this day, I still talk to a lot of organizations that'll say, well, you're the first person we've talked to that said that's important. We're spending all of our time cleaning surfaces. And that just, uh, you know, so there's so many people who aren't getting that message. And I'm a firm believer, look, you tell people what it is and they'll put in controls. They're already hand washing. Many people are masking, more need to be, uh, trying to do distancing as best they can. So if they have this information, it just means, hey, maybe they'll open up their windows a bit more or, or their office will improve the filtration, right? We won't know the breakdown of mode of transmission for, for decades. We're still arguing about that for influenza. Here's why it doesn't matter. If it ends up like my study says, my team study says 40%, or somebody else says 5% or 1%, why wouldn't we just put that control in place? We're not asking for these million dollar interventions, right? In schools, I'm saying, open up your windows. Um, so it seems like very little downside risk to acknowledge this is happening and, and let people put in additional controls. I actually think it would also help advance the mask argument that people would say, okay, look. This but, is it is, but it is the same problem that we had with masks. Don't wear masks, they're useless. Oh, wear masks and then it gets people confused. It's not aerosol, it is aerosol. Oh, it's not aerosol. I think the communication is going to be the biggest problem in why you know general population has or has not taken on uh, a, a guideline. Sorry to interrupt. I, I agree with you 100%. You think about how different we'd be, you know, look, it's, it's leadership, it's failed leadership that's what it is, right? If you had a leader that comes in and says, this is serious, take it seriously. Trump, we heard the tapes. He knew it in early February. It travels via air. Uh, if you had a leader that comes on and says, everybody wear a mask in, in end of March. I wrote a piece in early April. The debate is over. Wear a mask. CDC, wear a mask. And then you have a leader come in and say, ah, you can do it if you don't. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to wear it. Undercuts the public health message. You could think about where we'd be. Uh, we'd be in a much different place with better leadership and communication. So this is it feels like we're just pulling everyone and saying, hey, please listen to us. We can't quite get the, the federal leadership to pay attention to this. And it's, it's influencing our, our scientists, the communications of the scientists at our top agencies like CDC. So that is, that is the problem. This is a communications problem. I spend all of my time, you know, we're scientists doing the science, but like Jeff said, doing, or just Scott said, doing interviews all the time, op-ed, writing an op-ed almost every other week. I can't wait to stop writing op-eds. But you know, it's like we have to get this into the, into the people's hands so they can protect themselves. Um, let me address the, air, the airplane question because it's a really interesting one. I, I saw those studies. Uh, I've studied airplanes for over 10 years. I was a lead author on that 2013 National Academies report on infectious disease transmission airports on an airplane. So studied this pretty well. The air quality in an airplane is good. You have 10 to 12 air changes per hour. Everything, recirculated air is running through a HEPA filter. Uh, it's my position that the, the time on a flight all the engines are growing, ventilation going, is low risk. In fact, it's lower risk compared to the rest of the travel experience. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get it on a flight. You can get this virus anywhere. It's just, we're talking about a risk continuum here. Um, but I do know those two studies, and, and uh, I'll take the smaller one first. That one did a really nice job. I think four people got it. They actually did the genomic sequencing, so they can okay. confirm that happened. The other one, I'm really skeptical of it, to be honest. Did transmission happen in the plane? Maybe. I think the authors overstated it by a lot. It was 15 people. Uh, many were concentrated in business class. They said they ruled out post-flight transmission. But I went in and looked at their supplemental information, and you look at the time course of symptoms. Some of the people's symptoms started 17 days after the flight. That's well beyond 
the incubation period. But the authors totally discount it. In fact, five of the people had incubation periods beyond 12 days. And if you look at the time after they got off the flight till they had symptoms, I think it's three, maybe five people went on a cruise ship. All of them stayed in hotels. So the authors say, well, there's low community spread at the time. Unlikely is probably the airplane. Maybe the airplane. I'm not discounting that. Maybe a transmission event happened. But I'm not, I don't think their conclusions are as strong as it seems. The last thing I'll say is this, um, you know, we also have to look at the denominator here. You know, when an airplane, when it's an airplane crash, it's headline news, as it should be, because we learn from it how to keep us safer. But it doesn't mean flying is not safe. Same thing with this, right? We have this, uh, this study from March. There were over 7 million passengers in the U.S. last week alone. So the denominator here is quite large. I think if this was this ultra high risk environment that sometimes we think, uh, or the general public I think thinks or associates, we'd see a lot more spread than we do. I also wanna point out two other things. People weren't wearing a mask at that time in the airplane, so that would further reduce risk now. And two, I'm not advocating everybody run back on the airplane right now. I still think we should be very careful, only doing trips that are absolutely necessary because airplanes are great vectors of disease. So while your risk may be low, they do effectively transport people who are sick sometimes and seed new outbreaks globally. We've seen that, of course, but even within country. Thank you. Uh, this is really fascinating. And a lot of questions are coming in uh, as we're speaking. Um, one of the questions was about the CO2 that you mentioned. And I think you've already answered that because as you said, um, you know, the CO2 count is reflecting ventilation, uh, but the filtration is also another consideration. So you wouldn't want to focus narrowly just on CO2, but it is an easy way to measure and to see what's going on with the ventilation and the number of people in the room and so on. Um, but there is this general question that I think is behind a number of the ones that I've been looking at which is uh, maybe related to one I asked earlier about why this is going on, and, and, but it's been posed a little differently, which is that, you know, why aren't the incentives aligned here for uh, buildings to be designed in a way that is healthy for people, um, which as your, as your, your, your book is implying uh, and your article in the Harvard Business Review that um, you know, it's actually in the interest of companies to make sure they're operating in healthy buildings because their employees um, being healthier are going to be more productive. That's in the subtitle of your book. Uh, so what, the one question is about the uh, incentives and um, why that hasn't been done. And then maybe I would ask just to go along with that. Do we need, I mean, normally when we address environmental issues, certainly outdoors, we devise standards that we think need to be met um, with some basis in epidemiology about the effect that concentrations of different pollutants have on people's health. I mean, th that work is always ongoing and there's um, a lot of controversy about whether thresholds exist and so on. But nonetheless, that, that's, we have a scientific basis for choosing uh, standards outside. So uh, maybe I would just take that question that I think the number of the students are asking and just turn it around also just to ask, you know, do we have standards like that uh, for indoor? Uh, and if not, um, any idea why that is? And can we, can we get them? How do we get them? Yeah, really uh, great question. So thanks for the group of people that seem like you coalesced a whole bunch of questions there. Um, the first is this on incentives. So yeah, you know, why hasn't this been happening? Well, this is something we actually spend a lot of time in the book looking at because really the problem is split incentives. And I talk about this in the opening anecdote in, in the first chapter about my background. Having done, um, I did a, uh, I used to do Legionnaire's disease outbreak response. And um, so I did one where someone had died in, the, in this hospital. Um, they spent a fortune on the response. They ultimately settled the lawsuit for millions of dollars. I won't tell the numbers so you can't figure out who it is, what this is. Um, so uh, to me, I tell the story that, you know, I went back to my boss at the time and said, you know what, I'm gonna draft up a Legionella risk management plan for this hospital. I had put this in place in other hospitals where four people had died. 
and no one had gotten sick since we put in this program I developed. And uh, I tried to sell it to the hospital. I thought it was no brainer. In fact, we thought we underpriced it because they had just spent millions of dollars. My plan was $20,000. They didn't buy it. We were essentially guaranteeing that no one would get sick again. Why? Who bears the cost in that case, the 10 million? It's the insurer. That's a different, the risk management uh, is a different pot of money. Who bears the cost of the 20,000? Well, that's the facilities budget. That's a lot of money in a facilities budget. So there's this massive disconnect within an organization on split incentives. There's also in commercial real estate in particular, a split incentive between owner and tenant. So if I'm the owner of a building, what's my incentive to make this really great healthy building? And then Scott, you come in with your company and you get the benefit to your workers. Well, maybe I'd, maybe I'd want to skimp on ventilation because you, know, you don't really, or you aren't paying attention to the science, you don't know any better, and I'd be eating that cost. So the case we make in the book is, look, the wins are so large when you start focusing on people. People are the 90% cost of a business that everybody has a place to win. In fact, the owner can charge a premium, the tenant gets the benefit and will be willing to charge a premium. One of the colorful characters we bring in is David Levinson, a real estate developer, owns uh, developing 425 Park Ave, right in Manhattan. Lord Norman Foster designed building. He says, look, in an up market, I get the tenant, a down market, uh, and up market, I get the premium, down market, I get the tenant. It was a risk hedge for him and it's actually paying off. And so this misaligned incentives can be broken once you factor in the health benefits and there's enough for everybody to win actually. Uh, and then currently that incentive has fully changed and shifted. So because now the new minimum is a healthy building, who's gonna go back into a building that's not doing these things? So the costs are just enormous. The costs are a closed building. Or we bring in an example from a glass door, people reporting about their building. How is my building any different than being on a cruise ship? Well, if that is out there in the public, which it is, that's now tied to your brand and your building. That decreases the value of your building. So this, this split incentive issue can start to be broken if you start to think bigger and think about that, the human health aspect outside of the, you know, the narrow wins everybody can buy for. Uh, in terms of the second question there, you have the EPI studies. I, sometimes I do this in a, a presentation on, on for particularly with students too, to think about, you know, why isn't that EPI happening that we have for outdoor air pollution? But take a step back and think about how you know what you know about healthy living. So if I asked you, what do you, what do you need to do to live healthy? Everyone is going to say, well, I have to eat healthy. I should probably go out and jog for 30 minutes today. That's important. Outdoor air pollution is bad for me, no smoking. How do we know this? Well, we know this largely from the great human epidemiological cohort studies, the great epi. You think about the Framingham Heart Study, the Nurses Health Study, right? These massive studies, uh, cohort studies. Well, they do a great job on these lifestyle factors. What do they not do? They don't do anything about the built environment. They don't ask about the home, sometimes about work. It's this massive gap in our knowledge. Imagine that that had been part of the Framingham Heart Study and it said, wow, people who live in this kind of home are at higher risk for heart disease, whatever it is, right? People say, whoa, I didn't realize cooking with a gas stove leads to asthma exacerbation. We don't know that from those giant studies. What's holding it together, and this is my bias, the indoor air field is a small field. I bet people don't even know there's a journal called Indoor Air. I'm an associate editor, right? We're this like narrow group. There's a, there's a handful of universities around the world really doing this. So it's underfunded, underpaid attention, despite the fact that we spend 90% of our time indoors. Um, so that's why we have these great standards for outdoor and probably why we don't have the same attention on the indoor. Now there are like the OSHA occupational exposure limits, the NIOSH recommended exposure limits, ACGIH has their uh, threshold limit values. Again, these are more, these are worker health and safety limits, um, but really designed for industrial environments. Not, not thriving in your home, not thriving in schools, not thriving um, uh, in an office. So it, we really need a shift there. There are some efforts, you know, my group put out what we call the nine foundations of a healthy building, saying this is what the science says, this is maybe what we'd like people to start paying attention to. There are some new certifications out there that fit well out of the CDC in the US saying, hey, these are the things that you need to have in your building that are tied to health. Um, so anyway, there, it's, it's being held together by a, a small, a relatively speaking, small group of scientists compared to the, like the outdoor ambient air quality epidemiology. Uh, interesting. There's another question that was asked um, 
that about the, how this um, uh, applies in, in the poorest countries. Um, now, a little ironically, one of the issues that we've been interested in for quite a long time in developing countries is indoor air pollution, particularly around cook stoves. I don't know if you've ever been in a, uh, a country where people are cooking indoors with fires, but it's very smoky and the people who are exposed um, to that smoke uh, develop a number of um, uh, chronic conditions, uh, respiratory infections and other problems, allied problems. And so there's actually a fair amount of work on that. And there's some efforts to try to bring about change. Uh, the question that was asked though is kind of the opposite of that, which is that in developing countries where the outdoor air is so bad, yeah. uh, you know, is this trade-off as relevant for them? Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, so really great comment. And first, I'm really glad uh, whoever brought that up because um, I want to address that, that you know, we're talking about here, you know, I mentioned 425 Park Avenue. Well, my, this healthy building movement would be an absolute failure if it's confined to buildings like that. They have the resources. It's Midtown Manhattan, right? This has to be a movement for everybody. Uh, and I, I do some work with colleagues, pulmonary physicians doing work in Uganda on exactly that. It's biomass indoors. And how do we come up with solutions to reduce that risk of exposure or risk from exposure to indoor particles. And we, we have some interventions going where uh, around um, uh, using solar cookers and solar uh, power to kind of reduce the use of these kind of fuels indoors. And we see the air get cleaner. So we have some monitoring that's taking place. Um, but it's a really good question in terms of say, is the answer always bringing more outdoor air? Well, not if you're in an area that has bad outdoor pollution or it's a real challenge right now in the West with the wildfires, right? They just experienced um, you know, these remarkably, unbelievably high uh, particle concentrations. And, uh, and so the answer there can't be just bringing more to outdoor air. One of the studies we have done, is the, it's, uh, it's our global study. We have, uh, we're in seven different countries. We're measuring indoor air quality in office workers. We have almost 500 people enrolled and one of the things we look at, we have a paper coming out on this soon, is that relationship between places with bad outdoor air pollution and indoor air quality. And importantly, what's happening between indoor and outdoor air, the building. And so how the building operates, specifically in this case, the level of filtration you have, will determine how much that outdoor air, how much the indoor air looks like outdoor air. Mm -hmm. The reality, the truth is, your, the majority of your exposure to outdoor air pollution occurs indoors. Outdoor air pollution infiltrates indoors and gets reduced by some percent. We spend 90% of our time indoors. If you do the math on it, we, walk the, we work this out in the book really simply, more of your exposure, you're breathing in more outdoor air particles from your time indoors. The building can break that. And we show that in buildings that you have a higher level of filtration, like a MERV 13 filter, MERV, that captures 70, 80% of particles in the PM2.5 micron and smaller range. Um, deep, you see the decrease. In fact, it looks like a disconnect. Outdoor air particle concentration, 100 microgram per cubic meter in some of these cities, right? Indoor, 10. In some places where they don't have the good filters, 100 indoors looks like 30 or 40. I've been in these buildings and it feels like you're breathing in outdoor air pollution indoors, right? So it's key to that message that the indoor, you know, the building can break that. Um, one comment on the wildfires, I've heard some people say, well, in a condition like that, we just want to turn off ventilation entirely. It's not true because you still want to bring in air and filter it, control the point of entry. Because if you shut everything off, you depressurize your system. And then these particles will find their way into the building every which way. You want to have enough air coming in, filter it, and positively pressurize relative to outdoors. So you're pushing air out of every crack and crevice. And that decreases the infiltration rate. So again, another example of how, you know, the building kind of intervenes and it's really, you know, it's the missing link in air pollution epidemiology. We're always using outdoor sensors, right? But it's that time indoors and this building, we still see the signal, of course, but you know, the next, uh, who's going to solve that one that says we're going to link the outdoor epi studies to the indoor accounting for the building and how that might mitigate these exposure response functions for outdoor air pollution. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a really exciting uh, area of research, I think. Joe, that is uh, absolutely fascinating. Is there, maybe it's your project, but is there an attempt to put uh, standing uh, meters inside in random places, if that's a meaningful idea, in high uh, air pollution, high PM 2.5 environments? 
uh, because we can look by the moment or by the hour at uh, air, the air quality index or PM 2.5 around the world, but never have I seen anything about the indoor quality. Yet those meters uh, are quite low cost and one could presumably make some kind of uh, systematic monitoring uh, of this in different grade buildings in different environments. It, yeah, so really good comment. It's happening. Um, and we talk about this in the book a little bit, that what's coming is the democratization of indoor air, air data. And it's because of these low cost sensors. And even if you look at what's happening in California, there are these networks out there and people are reporting, hey, my personal monitor says this, everyone's starting to report. So you have the EPA network, but then you have other people saying, here's what I'm seeing in my home. Uh, you know, there's a group in Taiwan that did the same thing, put a couple thousand of these low cost sensors out and you really get a good sense of the temporal and spatial wow. distribution. What's interesting and maybe something that people don't think about is that um, companies are doing this. So, all right, everyone has, uh, you know, but not everyone. So you have um, Alexa in your house or, the, you know, the Google platform and Nest thermostat. Well, think about if you have a, um, a portable air cleaner that's Wi-Fi enabled. Many of these newer ones have sensors in them. The companies that make these are sitting on millions of data points of indoor air quality. Mm -hmm. uh, I just talked to the company Velux. They make skylights. Their skylights have air pollution sensors in them. So these companies are the repositories of massive data on indoor air quality that none of us have ever had. I'm trying to get access. To, I'm sure other people are too. I'd love to see the data because, right, we, we did what we think is a very large study, year-long study, 500 people, seven countries. That's great, right? Uh, but they're sitting on millions. Yeah. Uh, and across these events, wildfires and COVID and people heading indoors. So um, this is a really, you know, there, there's really wild data sets that are out there that have not been tapped, at least as far as I've seen. Have, have you looked at the studies that purport to show a link of uh, air pollute, outdoor air pollution, but air pollution and COVID uh, morbidity and mortality? And do you credit those in general? Uh, you know, the argument being that there's more lung, chronic lung uh, disease and so forth, and therefore more vulnerability to severe outcomes. Yeah, they're, they're, these are really good studies. And, um, you know, it's my colleague, uh, one person who's leading this is Dr. Uh, Francesca Dominici. She's a world-renowned statistician, you know, it, the best of the best. Um, and, and so, you know, when it comes from that group and her, um, this, is, this is good science. Yeah, and I do believe it. I think it's plausibly mechanistically. They've been doing these kind of analyses like you all too, right? These large, massive epi studies. Um, and so uh, it's not some new fangled analysis that, uh, that they came up with. It's, yep. it's tried and true and proven. So absolutely, there's Great. that's there. I believe it. Well, this is great. Uh, I really, um, maybe enjoyed is not quite the word. I've been totally fascinated. I'm a little bit nervous. I was thinking about buying one of those, um, uh, those uh, air pollution uh, monitor devices. Uh, and I was thinking about putting it outside. I have a little terrace in my apartment here, but now that I'm, <laughs> now I'm thinking I really need to get it and put it inside and find out what's going on here. And the other thought I had was, um, you know, we're assisted in this uh, webinar by Andrew Wilson, who's a PhD student, a student in sustainable development here at Columbia. And um, I hope he and other PhD students were making note of this uh, uh, opportunity of, of, of studying the data that you just mentioned, which would be, um, you know, really fascinating. Uh, so many students are trying to get data from Facebook and Google and places like that, but, but there are other sources. And uh, so that's a great tip. Uh, we're out of time, uh, but I want to thank you very much, um, Dr. Joseph Allen, for a brilliant talk. I uh, really appreciate it, and, uh, and thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Great questions, too. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. thanks so much, Joe. Phenomenal. Thanks. Thanks, Joe.